So, Pepper, I guess he wants you to go first. Uh, good morning. I'm sorry we're a little bit late. Uh, Senator Baruth's on his way. Senator Senator Benning's in court again. I know. I wish he'd get out of court so he could attend his meetings, Judge. I'll do what I can. Anyway. All right. Uh, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. This is clearly a very complicated area of the law, um, and hopefully by the end of today, with all these witnesses, you'll have some clarity on kind of the gaps in the system. I think that the, the Chittenden County dismissals, the Windsor murder case, exposed for, I think, the public what the state's attorneys have been trying to ring the bell about internally uh, for a number of years. Um, that there are significant gaps in this public safety gaps, I should say, in this intersection between the mental health care system and the criminal justice system. Um, I asked Peggy to post a memo that one of our deputies wrote in 2018 that really crystallizes some of these gaps for, um, that exist in the order of non-hospitalization in the criminal justice system. All those copies, all the copies in here. Okay. So the the gaps that I the gaps that are identified in this memo and that I'll just talk about today is that the Department of Mental Health is concerned with treatment of the individual. They're not directly concerned with public safety risks posed by the people in their custody, nor should they be. Um, the lack of adequate bed space. Uh, invariably means that there's tremendous pressure on the DMH to move people into community-based care. Um, DMH lacks the ability to adequately supervise people who've been downgraded to orders of non-hospitalization. There's no provision in the law that allows DMH to notify the state's attorney or the victim when a person in their custody is being discharged or downgraded after a 90-day period. And then there's other issues. From hospitalization to non-hospitalization or from non-hospitalization to community care, either one. From from the downgrade to community care to the non-hospitalization or to just the not seeking a renewal right. order. So anytime there's a downgrade. Right. There's protections that happen within the first 90 days yeah. that include notice, um, but after that, um, the Supreme Court's determined that those How didn't okay. fall away. There was a hearing on Elizabeth Teague. It was, a public, it was public that there was a hearing, and the state's attorney in Bennington County went to the hearing 25, 30 years after the uh, murder of the uh, plant manager at Everready in Bennington. How did we know that? I mean, I knew that because it was in the local paper. So I'm, I'm a little confused about how we would know about that if we can't provide notice. Well, there's a provision in the current law, in um, which you can actually see on page three of the bill, which says that the state's attorney shall be given notice 10 days prior to a discharge. The Supreme Court has subsequently said that uh, that applies during the first 90 days, but not afterwards. So I don't know when the, this T was before all, but it, was even, it precedes HIPAA. Right. So that may be a grandfather, but um, I mean, that was maybe a year or two years ago. I don't remember exactly. It was, you know, recent enough. To, I remember Erica saying, well, you know, and I talked to her about it, I remember her saying I went because, you know, I felt that we had a duty to protect the public. I, I, don't, I don't know why that was made public. Perhaps, you know, some of the other witnesses could talk about that specifically. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either, so I'm just curious as to how one thing could be public. <coughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, I'm, and I don't know the specifics, I don't mean but to yeah, no, but right, it's, I mean, 
really there's a severance that happens when the when there's a commitment order and between the kind of mental health and the treatment aspect and the criminal case. What, what I've heard from Vic <coughs> that this is the the goal of the bill, quite frankly, is what I've heard from victims is one, the lack of notice, the, the knowledge, and number two was the, the, the fear that that person is still dangerous to them or to their family members. And um, that that is what was key. Now, the, obviously, the Chittenden cases are different from the Windsor case in that the Chittenden case, the charges were dropped, so there was and that makes it even more confusing to try to deal with. But, you know, I, I don't... I would like to have a bill, but I, I don't care what it looks like. Just to, I think it needs to address those two problems. Right. And I think that is precisely where the state's attorneys are. I think this bill, uh, S-183 in its current form, it proposes solutions to those issues. They're probably deficient, and I'm sure there's other witnesses today that are going to explain in great detail why they're deficient or may or Well, part of it, the genesis was discussions last fall with the former state's attorney in Windsor County. <laughs> so a lot of it came from there, and I don't have it. I don't think any of the sponsors of the bill have an ownership over the solution. We just wanted to bring forth something to get the discussion rolling to see what we could do to improve the situation, particularly for victims and the public. That, and I'm <coughs> glad to hear that because I think that there's actually a lot of agreement on those issues around notice, uh, particularly you know when someone is found incompetent to stand trial and then they're committed to the Department of Mental Health. There's very little notice to the state's attorneys after that 90-day period. If, if they're being discharged, and that, that's a charge that can be refiled. And, you know, that's, if the person is then competent, you know, the state's attorney should be put on notice to do a competency evaluation and rebring the charges. I started nitpicking and you weren't finished with your, <laughs> uh, but uh, while I'm nitpicking, I want to concentrate on one thing you said, and that's the lack of beds, which is what I've heard from a number of other folks is that if somebody is taking up a bed who's a forensic patient who doesn't really need that treatment, we're taking a bed away from somebody who may not be a forensic patient who needs that bed. So that's another problem, particularly in, a, in, in light of the lack of bed space for uh, that we have in the state. So that's another problem that is is, wasn't planned as part, I don't think the sponsors considered that, but what also came up, and I, Corey Gustafson is going to speak to it, I think, a little later on. Evidently, Medicaid is phasing out payment for forensic patients, which means it will all be general funds in the next couple of years. And I don't know, we need to get more detail on that, but that does make a difference in how we look at that. Yeah, and that's my understanding as well. Um, so. I mean, to say that the lack of beds is driving decisions is an overstatement, I would say, but it certainly, I think, has to be playing a, a, a role in the decision-making about whether to move someone into community-based care. And I think fundamental to our position is that there's inadequate supervision of someone through the designated agencies when they're in on an order of non-hospitalization. <coughs> I'd be happy to talk, you know, about the specifics of the bill. Um, you know, I, I, you heard from David. You know, he chose three-year initial um, initial commitment order, mostly because uh, mental illness can wax and wane over time and um, can be episodic. And he really wanted to ensure that there's adequate supervision of an individual before any sort of <coughs> discharge is being considered. Um, that could be, um, I mean, it would be, that three years would be consistent with kind of the least restrictive setting necessary, so that could be 
order of hospitalization or order of non-hospitalization. Um, Pepper, does the, does the waxing and waning, um, is there data that is being drawn on for the three years for that, or could it be two years, could it be 18 months? I, I don't know specifically why the three years was chosen, other than, you know, there was some talk about New Hampshire and, um, you know, kind of what other states are doing. And, uh, I think um, the reason the three years was chosen was because um, uh, David Cahill felt that five years would probably be, not be something that the legislature would approve, and he thought maybe he'd start at three years and see where we go. It, it's, you're going from 90 days to three years, so. Yeah. And that? There's no magic to any of that. Yeah, that's, that's just my concern is that we're, we're uh, going from three months to three years, which seems like an amazing jump if um, I take the point about wanting to see a patient over a uh, span of time. Three years when they've been found innocent by reason of insanity or not guilty by not. reason of insanity um, seems contradictory. But, but, but the me. question is, uh, <coughs> not, at what point don't they are they no longer a danger to themselves or others? Right, and that's not part of the. <coughs> that's where the. You can't. I mean, somebody could be ninety days. It could be twenty-five years. No, I, I get that, but I mean, at 90 days, they're not um, they're not let out. They just have a hearing, right? Right. So, I mean, in miniature, it's like the argument we're having over life without parole. Right. Well, in um, juveniles, yeah. in the juvenile system, yeah, I think you have a hearing every six months now, or is it every year? Uh, the juvenile the reviews, yeah. Yeah. It's every there's a review every periodically to determine whether the juvenile should stay in custody or not. It used to be six months. What six we're talking months. about is really where the rubber meets the road in, in this, uh, is at what point, um, you know, if DMH is saying, or a clinician is saying this person is no longer in need of treatment, at what point do you rely on a criminal court judge or a victim or anyone to say, okay, but there's still a public safety <coughs> risk and uh, we need some supervision over them. And then the question then becomes, do they remain in DMH supervision or do they move to another supervision? Well, you, you, inadequate supervision from local mental health agencies yet. Um, and by that, I mean the designated agencies. You mean the designated agencies. Right, not, not DMH. So the designated agencies, Person released from DMH designated agencies. Right, that's the key based. Any other questions for Mr. Pepper? Well, what else would you like to know of your testimony? It seems key. <laughs> I mean, for us, again, the. Um, we have copies of that letter yet? Yeah, I'm going to go check their back up yeah. yeah, before he leaves, in case he covers that question. Yeah, I mean, the, the notice question is central to uh, what we would like to see changed about the law, the notice to the victim. Whenever there's a termination or a downgrade, um, and, uh, you know, that would offer the state's attorney the opportunity for more of a public safety aspect review of the case. Um, so, I, you know, again, I don't think anyone's wedded to the language in S-183, but I think it, I, it does, the solutions that are proposed, it's more important, I think, to look at the gaps that they're trying to address, not necessarily how they're clo how this bill closes those gaps. say the, the memo that is being delivered is, is written by one of our deputies who's, who works very closely in this area of the law. And um, he was on an order of non-hospitalization study, legislative study committee. Um, and 
proposed this. There's, he kind of states the issues, proposes some solutions, um, and it's all contained in the memo. Can I ask a question? Senator White. So are people <coughs> convict, are, are people um, found incompetent to stand trial in things other than murder and homicide? Because that's what we're talking about. So are we talking about anybody who is found incompetent to stand trial by, um, because of um, mental incompetence? or whatever the term is. Or are we talking about only those that have, that I have here that we're talking only about murder yeah, and homicide people. Right, and I think this bill was designed specifically to address the situation out of Windsor, um, which is not even competency. It's, it's really just people who are found not guilty by reason of insanity for murder or attempted murder, which I think there's a, there's a jury finding first that this person did this crime beyond a reasonable doubt, and then there's a question of whether they're absolved from liability uh, because of their insanity. And so, you know, I think for David Cahill, that's kind of the pinnacle of the public safety interest, people that are committing murder, and yet they can't appreciate the criminality of their acts. So we're talking about people who were found not guilty by reason of insanity. That's what the or a homicide or attempted homicide, but we're not talking about incompetent to stand trial. We're not talking about that in we're this bill. In I'm this talking bill. about it though, yes. I'm talking about that. Is that, that that's another gap. That, right. That, right, okay. So in this bill though, we're, it's only This bill is very narrow. Very. Very narrowly addressing okay. very, right increasingly yeah. rare situation, um, shouldn't say increasingly, just a very rare, rare situation. Yeah. Right. Okay. The, 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 okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, um, you, you phrased it as they were, they were found to have committed the act, but then they were um, found not to have liability right. because of their illness. Um, you know, that to me seems an important finding from the jury. And one that can be frustrating, I think, for the prosecution, can be frustrating for, for the system in general. But it, it seems like, and I remember David Cahill's testimony in Oversight, um, it seems like an attempt to sort of say, well, the jury should have, should have decided that they needed some years in prison. Um, and, and really, to my mind, once that decision is made, the person is more a, a patient, is more a, a medical case. Um, so I'm personally not disturbed by the 90 days, but I understand the desire to increase that. But three years seems a long time for somebody who was found not, in your words, to have liability for the crime. Well, but they did the crime. Right, but this says no less than three years. I will years. point out that there is another model we can use. Yep. That is Kansas. Do away with the insanity. I, and it's not necessarily that we're looking for a punitive uh, response. We're looking for supervision. Uh, it's not. It's not. We think that this person should spend some time in jail. It's that we don't think that there's adequate supervision of this person in, when he, if they're downgraded from an order of hospitalization to an order of non-hospitalization. And I, I see what you're saying. I guess the difference between the hearing at 90 days and the hearing at three years would be zero. It would still be medical professionals sitting down and, and making a determination. The only difference is that we're saying we're not going to draw on your expertise for three years. Right, and, and I actually, I think you'll hear from other witnesses that I think even with that three-year initial commitment order, there would still have to be reviews throughout. So but they couldn't be. They couldn't uh, be. De they could be downgraded. They couldn't. Yeah. They, they, the commitment order couldn't be terminated. Okay. Thank you. Yes. What did that mean? The commitment, they could be they downgraded. They would still be in the custody of the Department of Mental Health, on, but it could be in, in the community in the, base through the designated agency. Well, how, how can they be in the, under the supervision if they're in the community? 
they're in the custody of. Oh, sure. That's a lot of hospitalization. Oh, I'm being sure. The DOC has custody of people. Right, but is that an order of non hospitalization? Okay, great. Okay, that's what I. You got your own. No, I got my own ideas about how this came up. Okay, because I've been making notes on this one. Okay. Thank you. I don't care about your notes. Can you send that to Henry? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> the Defender General is now managing his portion of the hearing. <laughs> Next week we'll we'll hear back from the state attorneys and give you a reading of the hearing. But I'm joking. Um, for the record, Matt Valerio, Defender General. Um, when this uh, bill came up, uh, or the draft of it in the summer, we set about doing some research, and I passed this through our appellate division. This is actually an area of the law that when I was regularly in court, um, I actually, you know, you hate to declare yourself an expert in any particular thing, but I was involved in some of the more uh, high profile and difficult uh, <laughs> mental health competency and sanity cases that had gone to trial in Vermont over the last, you know, 20 years or so. Um, and the thing that I have found routinely is that um, the vast majority of lawyers have no idea what they're talking about when they talk about this area, and everybody else knows less than they do. Um, and, and as a result, it doesn't surprise me that when the proposal came forward, um, it's almost as though Dave Cahill sat down and wrote a wish list of what he would happen without doing any legal analysis at all. Um, and my appellate division was very excited at the prospect of this bill potentially passing because they would love to up their win percentage in a, in a significant way um, for all of the constitutional violations that are contained in the bill. Um, and I'm going to go down them. I tried to, I had like nine pages of stuff I wanted to talk about, but I've basically been able to get into about uh, large, large print so that I can see it, about two and a half pages. And I can list the various elements of the bill that are not legal under the United States constitutional law and Vermont constitutional law. Okay? Um, the, and this doesn't go really in the order of, of the bill, but it goes in an analysis that a lawyer would look at the bill in making decisions about it. Um, the first unconstitutional part of this is it this creates a um, quote unquote public safety hearing. All right. The US Supreme Court in a case called Addington versus Texas in 1979 said that it to have an involuntary commitment procedure, you can't just look at the state's concerns about public safety. Um, you have to balance it um, with the rights of the defendant um, in the case and what their, uh, what their interest in, in being released are, given the status of their health at the time. Um, the other thing, that, that's, so that's the first issue. The second issue, is SA uh, 183 unconstitutionally puts the burden of proof on the proponent of release. Uh, in fact, the state, and this is a case called Jackson versus Indiana, a 1972 case, the state has the burden, must always have the burden of proving that the person is in continued need of treatment under the definition um, and that the, uh, under the definition that I, I'll, I can talk about later but that the proof has to be shown by clear and convincing evidence, which leads me to the third constitutional violation, um, that this bill has an unconstitutional standard of proof. It talks about preponderance of the evidence with the burden being on the person seeking to be released, basically the moving party. In fact, the state has the burden of proving, as I said in Jackson versus Indiana, and, and that that standard has to be by clear and convincing evidence. Um, it's a constitutional due process standard. 
Um, the, the fourth issue um, is this unconstitutional mandatory minimum commitment of three years. Um, Jackson versus Indiana again um, talks about due process requiring that the nature and duration of commitment bear some reasonable relation to the purpose for which the individual is committed. So if they have a mental illness that waxes and wanes, if they are either treated voluntarily or involuntarily and they are no longer a danger to themselves or others, their, their release has to be available to them or they have to be held in, the, in a manner that is the least restrictive environment given the status of their, um, their mental illness. Why is 90 days constitutional? Um, good question. Uh, there's a case called uh, O'Connor versus Donaldson that was in, 19, uh, in 1975. And there's a Vermont case, State versus Mayor, that was a 1980 case. And what they did in these cases, they took evidence about um, the amount of time where you could reasonably expect to have somebody um, receive some amount of treatment and be subject to review, like there would be enough time for a change. So they based the 90 days, although it's not perfect in every case, that 90 days is actually a constitutionally determined amount of time based upon evidence that they had at the time um, where men mental health cases um, show improvement with treatment during that period of time. Now it might not work, and in fact, there's, a, there's another issue here, which is it is not a mandatory minimum, right? It's a mandatory maximum before you can have review, all right? So the 90 days, if somebody was, uh, quote unquote, better immediately in 30 days, there could be an early petition. Um, but you can't say, even though we have an early petition, we're going to hold you 90 days. The, nine, the, the mayor case in Vermont talked about, they, they used some, some nice Latin language that always drives people crazy, but basically what it says is indeterminate does not mean um, that it is, uh, it talk, it, the statute talks about indeterminate uh, amounts of time, um, but, the stat, but it was established as 90 days being based on evidence, a kind of a therapeutic period where review would be determined. Um, and if the condition that subjected the person to commitment no longer resists uh, or exists, then you have to hold them in a civil confinement that is the least restrictive alternative given their current situation. So how is New Hampshire's five years ago? Theirs has never been challenged. And I, and I can tell you why. It's a, it's a very similar thing to if this bill were to go through in Vermont, I'll, I'll take a detour for you. I, I, we have a listserv of defense lawyers. We have 300 and something people on them. And I put a, 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 a question out to them. I said, look, how many of you folks have ever had a attempted murder or murder case that went to a jury verdict that resulted in not guilty by reason of insanity? You know what the number was? Zero. Zero. Um, and I'll give you an example. One of the renowned cases in Vermont was one that I tried in Rutland in the mid-90s. Um, and there's a long history that is, uh, I think, confidential, but there's also the, the, the public side of it. I tried the, one of the Ron Bean cases in Rutland. And uh, he was charged with kidnapping and I think originally attempted murder and, and the like. We did a 10-day trial. and. Uh, and uh, I was using an insanity defense. Um, this will lead to two other issues that you'll, you'll see as we come through this. Experts on both sides, everybody agreed that the guy had a major mental illness. Uh, the question was uh, competency, and there was an issue of stand, uh, competency at the time of trial, or whether he was competent to actually even go to trial. And then there was the issue of sanity at the time of the offense. And, um, there are some lurid details in the offense, but the bottom line is we tried this case for 10 days. And um, lots of expert testimony. I expected the jury to be out for some amount of time. 
Um, when the jury went out, I actually I got in my car to go through the drive through at the, at the Burger King, which is about five minutes from the courthouse at that time. And while I was in the drive through I get a call on my cell phone that said, hey, the jury's back. And I'm like, huh, well, they must have agreed with me quickly. Well, I guess, so I come back, they're not, and he's guilty on everything. Guilty on every single thing. Um, during the trial, by the way, um, we had multiple requests for competency evaluations which were taking place. Um, we had doctors who are still working in the system now who said, yes, the man is actively psychotic, but the standard is so low for competency um, to stand trial uh, that we can't say that he's incompetent to stand trial because he knows who you are. He knows you're in a courtroom. He knows he's being charged with stuff. And even though he's actively psychotic during the trial, um, we're the you know we had people uh, disputing this on both sides, but the uh, the psychiatrist uh, who was evaluating said no he's he's competent to stand trial. Um, this is a guy. While I was trying the case, I was surrounded by um, a U-shaped table with black draping around it, and during the trial he was handcuffed behind the counsel table and shackled so he couldn't move, all right? And during the trial, he was calling out to things he was seeing in the courtroom, which were obviously not there, dragons and devils and various things, and, and shouting out and barking and doing various stuff like that. Um, and uh, we were behind there to, so that, you know, he was chained up so that the jury wouldn't know that and we were covered by the black draping, so the jury wouldn't know that he was chained up during the trial. Uh, but you could hear clink, clink, clink all the time. Um, in any event, the couple of things came out of that case because it was appealed, right? He was guilty on everything, um, and it was appealed, and two things came up. Number one is that you can't, it, it wasn't established at the time in Vermont, but you can't raise an insanity defense without the consent of your client. It's the client's choice, not the lawyer's choice. Right? There are subsequent cases, and that's the State versus Bean case. There's another case, State versus Tribble, went up and down a few times also. Um, and I advised the lawyer who was doing the case at the time, I said, I don't think you can do this, who also tried a diminished capacity case, uh, contrary to the wish of his client. <laughs> And also found, and in that case, it was also found you can't use a diminished capacity defense or a sanity defense if your client is found competent to stand trial. They have the choice whether or not to raise or waive those um, those defenses. Right. Which is strange because if they're incompetent, right. it's a it's a no. No, it's not. Found competent, found competent to stand trial. Oh. If they are found competent to stand trial. They, they, have the, they make the choice about whether they can do diminished capacity at the time of the offense or sanity at the time of the offense, okay. all right? Which is interesting, was interesting to me when a guy was actively psychotic, yet competent to stand trial, but making decisions about whether or not he was going to raise an insanity defense or a um, diminished capacity defense. Um, that having been said, Two weeks after the trial, I was walking down the street in Rutland, and there was a guy who worked in a stockbroker's office who happened to be on the jury. And he makes a point of coming across the street, and he grabs my arm. And he says, Matt, Matt, you did a great job with that case the other day. I'm like, well, thanks. It didn't, just didn't, didn't, quite, didn't quite feel that way because, uh, you know, the guy's looking at, you know, life sentence and stuff. And he's like, yeah, he goes, that guy was crazy. We're never letting him out. <laughs> Well, you wonder why yeah. an insanity defense by a jury in the collective memory of 300 and something lawyers, and I tried hundreds of cases over the time that I was trying cases, and I did big cases, did thousands of, or hundreds of DUIs, but there were, you know, I did murder cases, I did sex cases, I did all of the kind of the worst stuff that you can, you can think of. Richard Rubin has been practicing law for 50 years. When does insanity raise itself? Insane at the time. When 
the, the court's expert says, yeah, that guy was insane at the time. When the defense expert says, yeah, that guy was insane at the time, and the state doesn't have anybody to say he wasn't. But that's that's when it comes up. Back to the reality. That is the reality. As a well, the reality <laughs> as a state senator, mm -hmm. when you have the public, the general public, concerned about dropping charges against three individuals by one state attorney, and then you have the Windsor case. Mm -hmm. That's the genesis of a bill. I have no ownership. I, I don't care what the bill looks like as it comes out of here, but I think we have an obligation to address the concerns of the public regarding public safety when those cases are, are done like that. Now, I don't, I'm not here to criticize the state attorney in Chittenden County for dropping the charges. I, as I understand it, she felt she had no choice. Right. And in fact, and, the, and, and um, I respect that. But the, the public sees it as, you know, somebody got away with murder or attempted murder. They're wrong. Well, and here's, and there's all, I wanted to point out a couple of things in your bill that, that actually. That's why I pointed, I knew you would say that, so that's why I asked. <laughs> well, well I, want, I actually want to point out something in your bill that actually shows why people don't seem to get this stuff. Right? In, the, in the preamble statement of purpose of the bill, right? And throughout the bill, there are various places. It says, all right, this bill proposes to establish a three-year initial commitment period for persons adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity for homicide or attempted homicide. You know what homicide is? Right? It's killing of one person by another person. Homicide is not a crime. Murder is a crime. Right? And we go through, when we go through, murder has certain elements. Right. It, well, but, but it's a it's a term of art. It means something different in the law. So when you go through, and there are portions in the bill that talk about a homicide attempt. There is no, if you go through our bill, our uh, statutes, there is no crime of homicide. What people see is the result. They see the homicide, and they are appalled at that, and they feel like. There's no, in their mind, there is no difference between a homicide and a murder. But the law recognizes the difference between a homicide and a murder, okay? A murder is a crime. A homicide is the act, all right? So- Can you we, elaborate on that a little bit? All, all, all a homicide describes is one person killing another. <coughs> Justifiable homicide. Oh, okay. There's homicide by people who are, who are mentally ill and insane at the time, which we, don't hold them responsible for under the law because they're ill. There's homicides when a two-year-old finds a, a loaded handgun and mistakenly shoots a brother, mother, whatever it okay, is. Okay. And so you have one person killing another person, but we don't hold those people responsible because of their mental development, because of their mental illness, because of whatever their particular legal status is at the time. Whether it is a murder, <coughs> requires other elements, and it includes a mental state, right? Both first, de first degree and second degree murder, or aggravated murder, all right? Okay, thank And you. so, what we're really talking about people is people who are, who have illnesses, they can't appreciate the consequences of what they're doing, and that it renders them not legally responsible for what they did, and this is what the senator was talking about earlier. When you flip over into that world, you have to be able to, you're talking about the civilly confining people, not criminally confining people. And that con confinement has to be reasonably related um, to the time of treatment required to remedy the condition that led to the confinement, that is the mental illness. Um, and our statute to comply with the U.S. constitutional interpretation of that as defined as in State v. Mayor and citing Jackson versus Indiana and O'Connor versus Donaldson uses a 90-day review period because that is therapeutically the amount of time that is reasonably related to determine what is necessary for people to um, address mental illnesses. Um, the, 
the um, <coughs> I understand what the public is concerned about, and when I'm done with telling you what, I only have one more major thing that I'm going to talk about with what's wrong constitutionally with the bill, um, and uh, that is that uh, this unconstitutionally seeks to create separate civil hospital, uh, sort of a separate civil hospitalization process for mentally ill people charged with murder or attempted murder and um, in violation of the Equal Protection uh, Clause. Um, there's a case, again, Jackson versus Indiana, which talks about treating defendants who are adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity dissimilarly to other defendants violates the Equal Protection Clause. So you can't carve out the acts and say, we're going to treat these particular acts differently than if you're found not guilty by reason of insanity than the other uh, um, than any other crime. And the, the you know the so I understand the public's concern about this, and there are and there are issues that need to be um, addressed. And I'm going to give you some suggestions. And if, if you have any questions, of course, interrupt me. Yeah. So, for just that last piece about yeah. you can't treat people differently. <coughs> so, if, if we put in everybody that's coming out that's been court ordered into the hospital, does that cover that piece? If you put everybody who. Everybody that went into a mental health and a court facility on a court order. Oh, sure. and, and, and made it so that everybody coming out had to go through a court proceeding. You know, before they could be discharged, which I know there's other problems on that, um, well, there is that do away with the inequality. Of, uh, because we're just saying for persons with... You, know, you do have to treat similarly situated people similarly. So if they have a uh, major mental illness and they are put in an order of hospitalization okay. because they're a danger to themselves or others, you have to treat all of those people the same way. Okay? Yeah. Um, I don't think you want to do that with people who are, you know, charged with, uh, you know, retail theft and well, disorderly you conduct. Treat, and you can treat violent offenders differently from people who exhibit violence, can't you? In the criminal system. But what about the mental health If you're in the mental health system, if you are adjudicated not criminally responsible, now you get into a different area of law and you have to go through the process of so determining. Not criminally responsible for retail theft is the same as not criminally responsible for murder? If you have the same... Um, I, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it is. if you have the same mental illness, the same process occurs. Then, the, the, with all due respect, Matt, that's absurd. <coughs> you can disagree with the U.S. Supreme well, Court. I, I, I disagree with the U.S. Supreme Court and the <laughs> Supreme Court that would make that ridiculous finding. That somebody who commits a retail theft um, should be treated the same as somebody who commits a murder. That, that would mean we would civil, civilly confine people that, you know, we see them every day here in Montpelier mm -hmm. who, you know, are, have significant mental health issues or are in the community, and we would treat them the same as we would a person who committed murder. And what? And you still have to make a determination whether or not they are a danger to themselves or others, right? right? But, that, but that's absurd. It's not absurd, it's a law. It's an absurd claim, <laughs> in my Is opinion. It, the law? I, I it, it defies I common sense. <laughs> it, defi it defies common sense. It's just like saying that <laughs> because somebody has a concussion, they're more likely to murder based upon Aaron and Andis than the general public. I mean, it well, just it doesn't make any sense. That's a red herring. You don't know what's going on with him. <laughs> well, no, I know, but that but that's the same type of idea. It's not the same idea because the issue is no, somebody who committed a retail theft. Do you have any evidence that they were a danger to anybody? No. When you, when somebody commits a murder uh, or homicide, I did it myself, didn't I? Yeah. Um, <laughs> The, uh, you have some evidence that they have a danger to themselves or others by their actions. So it's not the same. The issue is those factors, what occurred, is a fact that is going to be determined, uh, helping determine whether or not they are a danger to themselves or others. And that's a big, that's a huge difference. Can I follow up on that just a little bit? So if you're, it isn't whether they, um, 
It's if they've been adjudicated a danger to themselves or others, then they have to all be treated the same. That's, that's if they're lot. under a hospitalization order, a non-hospitalization order, right? All those people in that. So we have. Well, that's the question. The next question is: Do you are you <coughs> should you be should it be a non-hospitalization order? Should it be a hospitalization order? And and then. We're going to, and the question is, are you a danger to yourself, a right. present danger to yourself or others? And then the question is, what type of treatment are you going to be receiving? And you have to be treated in a manner consistent with what is necessary to cure you, you know, something consistent with whatever your uh, mental health or disorder is. And you have to be held in a manner that is the least restrictive environment given your treatment status. Right, because we have a lot of people who have mental health issues who are not under either, uh, who are not under non-hospitalization orders. I'm anxious to hear what you think we nice. could do. Suggestions? Yeah. Um, well, the first and easiest thing to do um, would be to allow victims and their families when someone will be placed in the community on an order of non-hospitalization, um, give them notice through the state's attorney's office and their victims' advocates or by mental health, uh, or through a mental health caseworker aside. That to me <coughs> is a, you know, a, they know what's going on. Uh, you know, the, and by the way, in the Teague case, the, the case was dismissed. Um, so it, just like the ones up in Chittenden County. Um, so don't be under misapprehension there. But when that comes up, um, it does seem, you know, uh, Liz Teague, when she was in Vermont, uh, in the, at the hospital here, when we had a hospital, um, would routinely call me <laughs> all the time, <laughs> um, and uh, in, and uh, in any event, uh, I actually I believe as well that one of the issues is that the mental health system is not designed in the same way as the correction system, even though they're all under the agency of. Human services to follow people around, but for the very few people who fit in the category of your homicides or attempted homicides um, that uh, are in the uh, in the mental health system, um, I think it would be appropriate to create a small number of mental health caseworker positions charged with keeping a closer track on individuals who are formally charged with murder or attempted murder and are being released on non-hospitalization orders or subject to uh, uh, potentially the discharge, um, even if it's a matter of you know checking in on them. Because as has appropriately been said, uh, mental health waxes and wanes. It, a lot depends upon, you know, if if you're on medication or not on medication, or if your medication needs to change, or if you develop a toxicity to medication over time, um, and other, other factors that I'm not really qualified to talk about because I'm not a doctor, but we know that people go through, like we all do in our own mental health episodes, um, that are stressors that, that make us uh, more volatile. Um, and if we have people who are checking in on them on a regular basis, um, then, uh, then that could that could help. Um, to me, that those two items really get at what you're trying to get at without violating people's constitutional rights and without upending the entire system. Which, as I as I've indicated, it's it's not like there are these cases going to trial and juries are finding people not guilty by reason of insanity. The only times we've ever ever see those is when there's no counter evidence that they are anything but insane at the time of the event. And, and there are two ways that happens. One is by agreement, which is what uh, the state's attorney in Chittenden County did. And the other is uh, the way that Dave Cahill did it in <coughs> Windsor County, which is there's no contrary evidence, but you just throw it in front of the judge, and the judge has nothing um, but that evidence to rely upon in making the decision to uh, um, that the person was insane at the time. Um, juries don't respond well to this type of evidence for the exact reasons. Anybody, even you know, you know, the chairs 
position on, you know, you can't treat murderers differently than other, you know, you look at it and go, there's a dead person, or more than one, you know, it's a problem. Uh, and, and we understand that, uh, res that response, um, but you can't, you know, you can't kind of leave it to the mob to, to make that decision because the decision is invariably emotional as opposed to legal. Thank you. Um, I, I want to try to make it to the rest of the witnesses, so Matt's got but the, uh, I wanted to talk a little, just a little bit about section uh, section two. Uh, and I just, it talks about in that, in that section that there's going to be a study or a review of ODG psychiatric support services or find it. I don't know what that means because we don't really do any psychiatric support. We just we have a line item in our budget that is other personal services that includes a lot of different things: um, investigators, uh, experts, uh, um, transcripts. Uh, there's a lot of things kind of included. I'm trying in to that. get at where there's equal access to uh, equal access to professionals who might be testifying on one side or the other. Um, we, we routinely see people popping up on the other side of uh, cases that are the same people we hire. If, if that's, you know, if it's a matter of the state's attorney needs more money to hire experts, um, you know, I, I mean, I know what I do when it, when it comes down. If there have been times and uh, and I think I brought this to the attention of the legislature at the time, but during the Prue cases, there was a lot of psychiatric evaluation going on for two different people in two different giant cases, um, and that stressed our budget that time. Um, but it is not, that was an extraordinary, those were extraordinary cases, an extraordinary time, and I would expect to have extraordinary stresses on the budget um, because of them. Normally we're in good shape, but I have no problem, obviously, with doing that. Just as long as there's not uh, not some belief that we provide psychiatric support services, um, because that's that's the way the that second section is written. We what we do is evaluate, provide the information um, to the attorneys, and they decide with their client what they're what they're supposed to do. Um, I don't know if we need that section. The the uh, the other side the other thing about this kind of the undiscussed ele elephant in the room is the whole competency to stand trial mm -hmm. issue because that's mm -hmm. not part of this but I think it's what a lot of people um, are con are concerned about as well because the the case the most recent one that was brought back by the attorney general's office didn't end up being a sanity case it ended up being a competency <laughs> case mm -hmm. now it would have been, probably been an insanity case if it, had, if it had gotten that far. Right. But, you know, one of the things that we find is that with people who have mental illness, they don't want to be found insane <laughs> at the time. They will, they do not want to pursue sanity defenses or diminished capacity defenses. Um, and uh, uh, so you actually get kind of dumped into the silo of the uh, competency uh, matters instead of the competency side of things, instead of the sanity side of things. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that's why there's so few. Kind of question. Well, will you give us um, copies of that? But that's not my question. My, <laughs> my question was, I know that this doesn't deal with competency to stand trial, but I was really struck when you talked about the guy who was sitting in the courtroom seeing dragons around and yeah. yet was found competent yeah. to stand trial. So do we new, need to change, would that happen again today? Oh yeah. Okay, so do we need to change the, <coughs> the bar for what is, how well, we find that, competent to stand that's trial? That's kind of a long standing uh, and evolving, an evolved legal rule. <laughs> the, the standard for competency to stand trial in a criminal case is really, really low. Um, there's a famous case, the Colin Ferguson case in New York City where the guy went and shot yeah. up a, yeah. the, 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 he had some standby counsel against his wishes in that case and 
Uh, he described con the fact that Colin Ferguson was a, found competent to stand trial, given his mental illness, was all he really had to know is the difference between an orange and a Volkswagen bus. And, and uh, he, he what was What is competent. the difference? It's a. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I, I'm sorry. But, but, but you know, it, it's just it doesn't take much to be competent in court. Who do, who makes the decision about whether somebody is competent to stand trial? Oftentimes, it's again same kind of thing as, as sanity. But you have experts do evaluations. The court makes a determination. Ultimately, um, oftentimes, though, when it's very obvious, the uh, parties agree. The state and defense agree. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Do, any comments on the forensic portion study? Um, no. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next witness is uh, Karen Barber, General Counsel for the Department of Mental Health and then Morning Fox. I don't know if you want to come together or separately. Um, and I will urge other witnesses who are scheduled at 1030 that you are help, welcome to talk about the bill, but obviously there will, it will undergo significant change. So, but as frequently happens in this building. And I, I appreciate your time. And maybe uh, next time we take this up, Pepper will ask you, uh, I am trying to understand. I think I think there is. I think we all get confused by the term. So <coughs> the role of part of the Department of Mental Health as a treatment provider. For the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Karen Barber, General Counsel, Department of Mental Health. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Uh, I think what. Uh, Karen and I would like to do is go through some of what we've heard this morning, trying to help clarify uh, some things from the department's perspective, uh, uh, as well as then kind of get into some more details around uh, the actual proposal and uh, any concerns that we might have on, on that end. Uh, so uh, one thing I wanted to uh, start with uh, was uh, there was a fairly robust conversation about order of hospitalization and orders of non-hospitalization uh, being under the care and custody of the commissioner and such like that. Uh, and so we thought it might just make sense for us to take just a few minutes just to explain that process uh, and, uh, and what that looks like. Uh, and so people can be under the care and custody of the commissioner of the Department of Mental Health in two fashions. One is uh, under an order of hospitalization, uh, which is pretty clear and understandable. That means the person is ordered into a hospital and they're under the care and custody of the commissioner. Uh, it's an involuntary status. Uh, the other way that someone can be under the care and custody of the commissioner, also an involuntary status, is through what's called an order of non-hospitalization. And basically that's an order that says, uh, you're a person who uh, has met the statutory definition in order to be ordered hospitalized, the person has to meet the statutory definition of a person in need of treatment. And then to be placed on that order of non-hospitalization, quite frequently, they're also a, a, a patient in need of further treatment. Uh, uh, it's, it's the most common route uh, to an order of non-hospitalization in our state is after an order of hospitalization. Not always, but that is the most common. Uh, and so uh, the person is placed on an order of non-hospitalization uh, they uh, have met the statutory criteria uh, of being a, a person in need of treatment, i.e. they have a mental illness. As a result of that mental illness, they have been a danger to themselves or others. When they're being placed on order of non-hospitalization, they're seen as uh, not needing hospital level of care anymore, but are still uh, were in need of uh, further supervision uh, from a psychiatric standpoint uh, in order to uh, try to help the person maintain and remain uh, connected within treatment. Uh, an order of non-hospitalization uh, uh, will look like uh, <coughs> many, many other uh, court decisions or, or conditions of release from a court or something of that sort, where basically we'll tell an individual, these are kind of the circumstances and, and the, the guidelines, if you will, of your order. So while you're in the, in the community, you have to X, Y, Z, you know, thing. 
and typical uh, things are in order of non-hospitalization are you know, uh, an individual will continue to take medications as prescribed uh, or uh, will meet with their providers on, you know, when the providers schedule, you know, meetings, things of that sort. Uh, it might be that you live in a particular place uh, or live in a place that's mutually agreeable uh, between yourself and your community providers. Uh, so, uh, in fact, most of the people who are under the care and custody of the commissioner at any given time uh, are actually out in the community. Uh, uh, and so most people who are under the care and custody of the commissioner are actually on orders of non-hospitalization as opposed to orders of hospitalization. <coughs> so I just wanted to kind of to, to, to level set so that people understand that. If, if an individual uh, begins to uh, falter not do as well, maybe start to not take medications or doing other things that uh, would see, be seen as quote unquote a violation of their order of non-hospitalization, then the providers can basically through the department petition to the court to revoke uh, a person's order of non-hospitalization. That's not necessarily an immediate thing. Uh, uh, when someone's you know, probation, for example, uh, is, is uh, being revoked, that's a much harder, faster pull, if you will. Uh, whereas revoking an order of non-hospitalization, uh, it's a petition to the court, it's a court date being set, uh, and you know, testimony being heard. Uh, and so it's a longer process. And generally, the results of a revocation of an order of non-hospitalization result in just a, a few possibilities. One, the order of non-hospitalization could be amended. Uh, maybe there just needs to be a change in order to help someone kind of get back into compliance with their order. Uh, frequently, and the most common uh, result is uh, the seeking of an order of hospitalization as a result, that this person is you know, not engaging in their treatment, not taking their medications, and thus uh, the state is looking to revoke their order of non-hospitalization. Uh, one of the issues that, that has come up is that when that gets to court, if that person in that moment uh, is uh, not meeting the statutory definitions of a person in need of treatment, it's possible, and it does happen, that the judge will say that they don't meet hospital level kind of person in need of treatment level right now, and so the revocation does not does not happen. The person remains in the community on the order of non-hospitalization. Or if the judge finds that they do meet that that criteria, then the person is then ordered hospitalized. That's the current system. Yes. But what led to the bill is what it, uh, the governor asked the uh, attorney general to look into the cases that were dismissed in Chittenden County. And then we heard from uh, the state's attorney in Windsor County with concerns about what had happened in Windsor County in terms of lack of notice when a person was leaving, although he, he did get notice informally. Um, I don't know if it was illegal or what, but it was. Um, and I'm curious about you know, that situation in Chittenden County, despite the governor's intervention, appears nothing changed. Um, the, one of them died in the meantime. But, um, so can you speak to that, how that not not necessarily those three those cases, but how you deal with victims who call and want to know what's going on with so and so or. So it's important to remember that the Department of Mental Health is a covered entity. We are a health care provider, so our job is to provide mental health care to people in our care and custody. Yeah. That's federally protected information under HIPAA, right. and so. But you can do we, exemptions. To that. If we do not have a release, um, we don't share information. That's someone's personal information. But, but the law does allow exemptions. To that. If this if this bill were passed with an exemption to allow you to notify victims. So, for example, so um, there is a kind of a catch-all provision in HIPAA that does allow if um, if a law otherwise requires. Um, but my understanding is across the country that that's it's not as simple as the legislature passing a law. That it still has to be consistent with HIPAA and it still has to meet the requirements. So um, obviously we don't have language in front of us that I can look at, but I think 
the Agency of Human Services is certainly concerned about um, making sure that we are meeting our requirements under HIPAA as a covered entity. There is a private right of action if you violate someone's HIPAA rights. Um, and also, you know, there's, there's pretty heavy sanctions from the federal government should we violate someone's protected health information. So that's certainly something that we are very concerned about and try to be very sensitive to. So does the governor have suggestions? <laughs> So, well, I think there's a <laughs> um, Well, I mean, yeah, serious. No, 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 I, I guess. I'm very serious in asking that yeah. question. And I'm not trying to, it's not a trick question. I'm not trying to trick you up. The governor, it, you know, expressed ex deep concern right. about what happened in Chittenden County. <laughs> he went as far as asking the attorney general to look into those cases. Um, we all know where that went. So my question is, does the governor or the administration, I better have said the administration, does the administration have a proposal to address the concerns? I think one of the, one of the things that we are looking at is uh, around the concept of uh, the Department of Mental Health when it's in criminal court. The uh, Department of Mental Health does not have party status. Uh, they're not. Uh, involved when it's in the criminal court system um, and so one of the things we'd like to try and see if there's a possibility of is how can the department have party status while the state's attorney is remaining uh, as part of the case as well and uh, that that could provide an avenue uh, possibly uh, for some of those things like victim notifications and, and so, uh, I think it would it's a piece that will have to be discussed. We have would to. You, uh, would the administration, or if you don't know, just say we don't know. Would the administration oppose some form of victim notification? I would have to say I don't know. Yeah. Well, we we had planned to put something into the bill that would address victim notification. Um, I, I, it is my understanding, my my belief that the administration. Uh, does have, uh, as I'm thinking about some of the different and various meetings I have had <laughs> around this topic, uh, <coughs> and victim notification is a piece that they're looking to try and solve uh, as well. Uh, I think the, the question is through what path are we going to get there? Uh, I, well, think that's, I think that's on everyone's plate. Uh, I think one example is the juvenile system, which allows us to notify victims of juvenile crimes. But they're and it would be a criminal offense if they reveal the information. The Europol system, too. Yeah, the Europol system as well, extreme risk protection orders. Here. We have a, a bill here that, well, the governor vetoed the bill, but not. Be, I don't think because of that, but there was an exemption there for um, medical professionals to consult with law enforcement when they felt their patient was a danger to themselves or others. So I, I think there's a general interest in this committee anyway in trying to provide some notice to the victims and you heard the Defender General's comments as well as the state's attorneys. So we'd have, anything that you have to offer if you contact Eric or Trudat. I didn't mean to Senator Hoyt. So when people are on orders of non hospitalization, um, do we have enough community resources actually in our designated agencies or elsewhere to actually provide um, what we need in terms of um, working with the patients or do we need to beef up our community health system, mental health system? Well, I, I, I'd like to just remind the committee too that the, the supervision that uh, the staff at the, uh, in the community uh, provide for individuals who are on an order of non-hospitalization is uh, treatment oriented and mm -hmm. the supervision is to uh, work with an individual to help them remain uh, in, in, engaged in treatment uh, to uh, as a, in an effort to help you know, their, their, them remain stable and stable in the community uh, and so uh, so that's the work that they do from that kind of supervision if you're talking about do they have the resources necessary to provide uh, public safety type supervision, uh, it's, that's not a resource that, that's not even an area of expertise that they 
could engage in. I'm not sure that they're different. And do we have enough to even provide the, the treatment um, that people need? Because we see our mental our designated agencies are so strapped sure. that I don't know that they can provide. I, I think it's tough in general. I think you know, uh, you know, I would look to uh, you know folks from Vermont Care Partners and others you know to, here representing the designated agencies to speak a little bit about that. Uh, but I know. Case managers and the folks in the community, they have very large caseloads. Uh, there are, at any given time, roughly 300 people uh, on orders of non-hospitalization in the community uh, that are being monitored by, by our community designated agencies. And so that's a significant number of folks. And I think it's important to remember that mental health treatment can't mitigate all risks. Mm -hmm. Treatment providers are there to provide mental health treatment. They can't address criminogenic or antisocial I'll out there. I'll go. <laughs> no, I'll do it. I, I like to yell it. Um, so people can be a danger to themselves or others for many other reasons other than their mental illness, and so. You know, really when someone's on an order of hospitalization or an order of non-hospitalization, the mandate, the statutory mandate that DMH has been given is to provide mental health treatment. And so that's really what we're focused on. Um, and another statutory mandate is to do that in the least restrictive setting. So again, that's something that, that we're focused on and making sure that we're doing. What, are there any comments on the studies that are out? Uh, comments as far as the studies? Uh, the Department of Mental Health is well versed in uh, uh, engaging in various studies. Uh, we've been tasked with many studies over the years, um, and uh, so we are uh, adept at, at managing that. Uh, so I, I appreciate you having that you're is looking not an at issue. The forensic, um, and you're, um, in this document, I, I yes. read it. Um, I particularly note that. The, uh, you know, Vermont is an outlier nationally in regards to terms of our lack of forensic systems. I, I think that's important and also love to know more about the Connecticut Psychiatric Security Review Board, which sounds like something else that, you know, is... is One of the uh, witnesses who will be speaking later uh, this morning uh, will likely be able to speak directly to that. Uh, <coughs> I think a lot of us have long been concerned of the lack of a forensic unit in Vermont. That it does take away from, um, it creates a lot of problems. And we've been getting away with it for quite a while here, though. I think it's, it's coming back to haunt us in my opinion. The department, uh, we have. We agree uh, that you know that's something that's been on our radar you know, as long as I've been you know with the department now for going on seven years. I hate to step on Senator Benning's toes. <laughs> there is a facility that, according to the governor's budget, <coughs> is closing. The governor's saving three and a half million. It is available. We'll talk about why I argued we should have had 50 beds back in 2011. Mm -hmm. well, we whether we should have or shouldn't. Have. It, yeah. it, I just, um, but can you, some, you said somebody's going to talk about Connecticut. Yes. That's good. Yeah. Are there other <coughs> things that you'd really like to let us know? I, I interrupted your. Yeah. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh, we'd like to just address a couple of pieces uh, that were in, the, in this bill. Uh, and it kind of loops back to this, this conversation. Uh, so uh, as far as the, the three-year initial commitment, uh, uh, a minimum uh, three-year initial commitment, uh, you heard uh, Defender General uh, uh, speak earlier uh, about the need for uh, treating individuals in the least restrictive environment, uh, that uh, we have both federal mandates as well as Vermont statute 
to treat individuals in the least restrictive uh, environment possible uh, for mental health needs. And the contemplation of a three-year, a minimum of a three-year commitment uh, flies in the face of the department's ability to treat an individual at the, the least restrictive environment. Uh, and so uh, that, that it just that in and of itself brings up concerns for us in that it potentially places the department, I think I said something similar to this back in July, August when uh, Joint Justice uh, Oversight Committee met uh, to first talk about this, that having a, a minimum of a three-year commitment uh, puts the department in, in an untenable, precarious position of either being in violation of this law uh, or in violation of federal statutes, federal regulations. Uh, and. So, so someone's either going to arrest us or sue us <laughs> in the end. Could you just clarify the, the precise conflict? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we have in state law with Act 79 uh, codified in state law, uh, the Department of Mental Health uh, must uh, provide treatment in the least restrictive uh, environment. Uh, and uh, the funding stream that uh, pays for uh, the, the federal Medicaid funds that are uh, supporting the, the state hospital as well as much of our inpatient uh, facilities receive federal uh, money. Uh, the CMS regulations also state that uh, an individual in order to be in a hospital uh, must be actively receiving treatment, must need, be in need of actively receiving treatment. If they are not in need of actively receiving hospital level of care, they must be discharged uh, or the goal has to be to move to that next lower level of care uh, in order to treat someone in, quote, the least restrictive, uh, least forceful environment. So it's the minimum itself that produces the conflict, not the time. Correct. Mm -hmm. but, and saying, you know, if it was a minimum of two years, it still would put us in, that, yeah, in the yeah. same, same conflict. Uh, and such and so uh, that that puts us in into this piece and uh, as far as being in this kind of position where we're, we're damned one way or the other uh, mm -hmm. but do you agree that the, the minimum of 90 days we currently have is, does not violate that because of what the defender general but is it, talking about it oh, could yeah. it could be up to okay. two years it could be up to I mean, my, my understanding put, the way I mean, this is I'm going back to the max testimony a little bit, but it, it, the up to is the thing that's missing. So if, if you're talking about the language changes to an up to three right. year commitment. Well, uh, three years, no magic three years. Right. It was picked because it's less than five. Um, because the, the important piece is that the treat the treaters, the psychiatrist that at that point says no longer, no longer needed treatment need to be able to have that ability to But actually, in reality, it could be up to 50 years. Well, if you said well, two, that somebody, doesn't No, I mean, in reality, reality in, no, let me finish, please, before everybody gets all stuck <laughs> because they think I said something stupid. No, 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 and never. The, the person who is, if the department feels that the person is in continued need yes. of supervision, that supervision could be up to 50 years. It, it, there's no upper limit. It just needs to still need that service. Am I correct in that? Well, in the current system. So, I mean, I, mean, I wasn't being, uh, I know and people, the department has people like to take anything that politicians say and use them against them <laughs> in a court of law. Um, and I love that about the system. Um, I see what's happened to poor Bernie and poor Elizabeth and poor Joe. And, you know, it, it just is it's incredible. So what I meant was it, it, there's no limit to how long somebody could be held based upon their need for continued treatment. But it, the burden is on you, not on them. Am I saying correct? Yeah, I mean, like on an order of non -hospital. Yeah, the burden's on you to continue that hospitalization or whatever. And that is, that is how it's currently set up. The burden is on us to reapply to the court to say this person is meets the statutory definition of a person in need of continued treatment. So the, the treatment. question then becomes your competency to determine how long that person needs that. It goes back to Matt's comment that if there are mental health caseworker positions to provide services in the community, that might include making sure the person is still taking their medication or if they're not, talk to them about it or whatever. 
think it's an interesting concept. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a new proposal, uh, first hearing of it, but I uh, definitely wrote it down. Well, I think that's, that's not a right like to the governor's proposal yesterday yeah. to embed uh, mental health workers in our um, state police barracks. Yeah. But, but how, would, how would that, I'm trying to figure out how that position would be different than the case manager that's working with. We need more case managers because it's the case manager that would be saying, deter, working with the patient. We don't need a separate positions to work <coughs> in, apart from the case managers that are, I don't understand how that, those positions would be integrated into the care of the, of the person with their case manager. Maybe Matt can explain question. that Maybe to me Matt later. Can, but I think that the idea is that somebody has that responsibility to continue to provide services to that person. I think part of that, that conversation then comes back to what we were speaking about earlier, which is, let's say in someone in the community, um, they're violating their order of non-hospitalization in some fashion. Um, not meeting with their providers right. or something of that sort, but in all honesty, are doing well and not in need of hospital level of care. Then what? Well, I guess the case manager would determine whether they... I guess my, my concern is, from the department's perspective, going into an order of non-hospitalization, seeking a revocation of that order because the person is violating that order, but not necessarily a person in need of hospitalization, <clears throat> What do we do with that individual? Do they remain in the Removing community? From so, the order of non-hospitalization, I guess. So we will be rewriting the bill to try to accommodate that <coughs> future witnesses. And if you have suggestions to contact Eric, but, um, I just also wanted to note that there's a Supreme yep. Court case from 1999 that's on point Olmstead, which talks about the unjustified placement or retention of people in institution constitutes a form of discrimination based on disability. I'm sure it's something um, that if legal aid or DRBT got to speak about, they would. Um, so just wanted to point that out there that you know putting this kind of artificial time limit also not only goes against I would say state law, federal law, but also Supreme Court um, case law. Yeah. The old New Hampshire still has five years. It and sounds it, like no one's contested that. <laughs> well, I know, but that's the time. You know. And I think the, the, the other piece that we wanted to just make sure and comment on uh, was around uh, having public safety hearings uh, <coughs> and such. Uh, again, the, the language in here speaks of uh, basically uh, after presenting the case, if the judge feels that you know, the person is no longer a danger uh, and the department is seeking a discharge, the judge would then say, okay, we can move forward. But if the judge felt that we did not meet that burden uh, and that the judge still felt that an individual posed a, a threat uh, uh, to public safety, that the judge would stop the department from that discharge. That comes back to that same point I was bringing earlier that by having a judge say you have to stay in the hospital, but a doctor saying, but they don't need to be here, puts us in the, again in that untenable position of either violating this law or the federal regulations uh, and federal laws that, that kind of guide us and lead us. Well, um, I'll say again, we're going to completely rewrite the bill for this break call. I think we appreciate the, the tenor and so the kind of the direction. Are, if there are suggestions for Eric or Katie yes. in redrafting, we appreciate it from the department. Uh, but I, I, uh, I do appreciate the, the efforts to kind of work together here to come yes. up with something that addresses the problems that we're outlining. So we're going to take a break to 10.30. Please be back at 10 30 for the number of witnesses. Tell me that's the southern part of the state. And we have somebody who traveled all the way from Arlington, but he stays here from time to time. That's in the southern part of the state for those of you who are not familiar with the southern part of the state. We're on the record? So, yeah, we're on the record. Yeah. Commissioner, interim commissioner. Baker. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Good to see you. My third weekend, I'm still here, Senator. 
still here. How many days left? Goodness. I, I'd have to check with my oh, wife. Sure. Right back. I'm keeping track of it here. I bet you you are, sir. Um, we're, I know you're, you're busy with a number of other issues. So Correct. I understand it. But, um, but we're trying to, any thoughts from the Department of Corrections? I know you have an MOU with the Department of Mental Health. There's been a long standing issue um, where people <coughs> by default end up in your department. Um, and uh, frequently they would be uh, more appropriate supervised by other departments. Correct. So, you know, looking at the bill, you know, Corrections OC is, is uh, very interested in participating in a conversation around the issue of what to do with folks um, who have acute mental health issues um, and, and, and where, they, where they should be housed. And, um, you know, the position of Corrections is, is that, you know, meeting with medical staff yesterday and getting briefed up and I'm, I'm, I'm probably about an inch and a half deep on this subject um, to this point. And I did spend some time with the medical staff yesterday, um, the medical team getting me up to speed on the services that we provide in facilities. And the number they gave, and this is not accurate, it was just kind of, they, they would estimate, the folks that are dealing with the mental health side would estimate that we probably have in our population now probably 50 folks who have acute mental health issues that at a given day prior may not have been inside our system. So my, my advice to you is, from Corrections' point of view, as you start um, going through this bill and trying to figure out how to deal with the issue that's in front of you, is that you know our prison system is not the place to have folks um, that have acute mental health issues for a whole host of reasons. Um, you know, primarily, yes, you could uh, build in a system where treatment was built into that process, but you know, inside our facilities, the day-to-day -day operation of the facility is, is about securing the facility. And, and then the support stuff that comes along with that. And it becomes challenging to blend in when you have a high need person um, that needs that high level of treatment. And, uh, you know, so for us, having that population blended into our existing system uh, would be a real challenge. And I'm not sure it would be in the best interest of the individual who needs the treatment. Joe, Joe. Do you have an estimate on what the average number of people in this condition and position are? Uh, when you say condition, you mean acute? Acute. And yeah, I, so how often they're in your bed space? Yeah, I think you know the staff told me we we probably house right now about 50 folks that, that they would consider acute need acute care. So I can't give you you know what that would average out to out to be, but you know that was the conversation as of yesterday. Yeah. Are many of them being held? You may not know, but I wonder if many of them are being held without bail and they're not sentence population. My sense of the conversation, and I'll try to this, but this is where I always have to be My sense of the conversation yesterday, Senator, was it was sentence population. I know that there are a number of people nationally, there is studies that indicate that people with significant mental health problems who are held in prisons because of uh, whatever crime, they're the ones that are held the longest as compared with the rest of them that are held on bail conditions. Now there are obviously, there are some people who are held without bail because of a murder charge or whatever, and they're, you know, they're, they know they're gonna get time served or whatever, and so they're not that concerned. But in the, in generally, those that are held the longest are those with mental health problems because there's no other place to look correct. And it's a sad use of our corrections beds. Yeah, and that's, and that's really what I'm cautioning about, right? I mean, especially as we, you know, as justice reinvestment moves forward and we start thinking about rethinking the way corrections operates in the state, um, you know, that, 
that just makes it, I mean, the, the population we're dealing with, I've heard, you know, we've talked about this in the short time I've been here. The population we're dealing with is very challenging. You know, with between the opiate issues and, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure out, is it the opiate issue that drove the mental health issue? Is it the mental issues that drove uh, the, the opiate issue? It's hard to, hard to deal with. And so the population that we deal with inside the facilities looks much different than it did five, six, seven years ago. No. Eric, I wonder if there's a way of working with the council of state governments in instituting and uh, stepping up provisions that they have. It's a, it's a county, it, it, the problem is that in the stepping up program is a county program that it provides uh, work to try to keep mentally ill out of jail who are charged and then they um, the counties, because the county jails, and you know, because we're a unified system, it becomes difficult to institute. There is a mental health court in Chittenden County, I think, still, but there's nothing anywhere else in the state. And it seems to me that we're missing, um, at least from a policy standpoint, that we should be looking at better ways to deal with this problem, um, even before, and so. Um, I know that I brought that up at the board meeting in Savannah, and they said that they were working on something for Delaware, I think it was. I can follow up on it. Could you? Yep. They're here today, we <coughs> can check on it too. Okay. Because yeah. we have our working group this afternoon. Um, Senator Nick gives our final working group meeting, and maybe we can follow up on something like that. Right. So I. I As part of this bill. Yep. I need to get clear on different terms. So when you said that there are approximately 50 people in prison who are needing intensive care, mental health care, uh, that's different than the population that's under, that's been um, not found guilty because of reason of insanity and are under the supervision of the commissioner of mental health. So the, none of those 50 are these people. Correct. The, because they're already Correct. in prison. So we need Very mental well. health services for them, but that's a different population than we're talking about in Correct. this bill. Correct. Okay. So, well, years ago, when we were over at Springfield okay. at the health center to confuse them further. Yeah. There were people who had significant mental health episodes, and the staff at Springfield were trying to get them into a mental health facility temporarily to deal with the mm -hmm. with the episodes, and the difficulty. One of the difficulty was if they got better <coughs> while they were waiting, they didn't get the. I mean, it, it just was the logic wasn't there, and they were frequently assaulting staff and other things because they weren't being dealt with appropriately. And so I think. Corrections developed a mental health unit at Springfield. Correct. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and, and again, I, you know, at this point, I know you're on this deep. I know there is a facility there. Right. So, right. And we tend to, but that's that's not this group that we're talking about in this bill. Right. Correct. But 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 my point is that I think the group you're talking about in the bill yeah. takes it to a whole new level, even above with what we're dealing with now, which, again. Our system is not, it's not the place to, to try to, uh, you know, assist those folks with, with their challenges. And again, Senator Wood, I, 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 I have to be careful because again, um, I, think, I think I answered it right for you because the difference between someone that's found insane prior to going to trial mm -hmm. and someone who, you, you know, uh, was insane at the time of, you know, deemed insane at, Time defense. I'm not really clear on all that language right sitting here right now. Okay. Yeah. I get that. Thank you. Questions? I mean, I think the hard part is, um, you know, granted, these people are in the prison system, but in fact, if there's absolutely no place to go, it's safer for them there and it's safer for the public. I mean, we've got to figure this thing out. It's terrible. We've been on it for years and we can't figure it out. Or we can maybe figure it out, but we don't have the money. Well, <clears throat> One of the ways that other states are dealing with it is what I just mentioned, and that is through 
diverting people before they get into the criminal justice system, into mental health courts or other vehicles. Yet in Vermont, you know, if you're in Chittenden County, I guess you got a shot at it. If you're anywhere else, you don't. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's hospital meetings, you go to them and they, they told horror stories of, uh, first of all, they got to get the sheriff to give the person a ride if it's, if it's uh, right. other than the person willing to go voluntarily. And then the bed gets shut off at like 9 o'clock or the bed is held for them to get the patient there for several hours or, you know, to, right. I heard that to like 9 at night and then the bed We heard that the yesterday. Hospital. There's evidently <laughs> the Rattleboro <laughs> Retreat as a policy that they, you mentioned it yesterday. Yeah. Um, we have the, the expert on the retreat here. Yeah, you know, the patient, the patient mix is bad, so they won't take the patient. So. Right. I mean, I understand that, but... You can't put a 17-year-old who's um, um, going crazy. That, no, no, that not, was, the issue was... Just, I, the issue was the sheriff was late like getting there. Yep. It was after 9 o'clock, and they said, no, we can't take it. Because they can't do an appropriate can't. assessment right. and admissions process. You I know, mean, they, see, the problem started in the hospital the night before, in the local hospital the night before, and then they finally find a bed for the person. Well, yeah. I think I, this is it, the wrong witness to yeah. ask. Yeah. So we'll solve that. I, like, and and the, this isn't connected to this bill. This no. is a whole Are there any other place of no places for people right. to go? But, that's Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. I'm afraid you're caring for this. So now you've, you've solved everything for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to jump ahead to, to hear from uh, Dr. Ribbon and uh, Dr. Bolton are both here. They came from Brattleboro, and I don't know if they want to come together or separate. From they talk to each other. No, she's from Middlebury. Oh, you're from Middlebury. Well, I was told that you were both from Brattleboro. Oh, okay. <laughs> really? I know where Middlebury is too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll start with Brattleboro and then go to Middlebury and then back to uh, Emma Harrigan and Tina Back. That's okay. Very good. Um, thank you so much for uh, giving me the time to speak with you. Um, and share my thoughts about S-183. Uh, my name is Simcha Rabin. Uh, I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I live in Putney. Um, I'll share a little bit about my background. Putney? Uh, Putney, yes. Putney, really? you know me. Really? Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's out of this world. Yes, great, we've already, yeah. we've already oh. talked about good swimming holes, but I won't <laughs> give directions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I serve as the president-elect of the Vermont Medical Society. For those of you who don't know, Senator White lives in Putney. That's why all the pay no attention. <laughs> Continue. Um, important, important geographic distinctions. I, I also serve on faculty at Yale University School of Medicine in the Division of Law and Psychiatry uh, for the past five years. And uh, my clinical focus and specialty is working with individuals with mental illness and violence history um, and or criminal justice involvement. And I've worked in a number of different settings in Vermont, Connecticut, <coughs> and Massachusetts. <coughs> and the Vermont Medical Society has identified forensic mental health as a priority. And we share your dedication to improving forensic mental health services and infrastructure in Vermont. Um, so I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I'll tell you a little bit about what that uh, training is. Um, it means I trained as a physician, then pursued four years of residency training at Harvard Medical School to become a psychiatrist, uh, a specialty which focuses on cognitive, psychological, and emotional health. Um, I completed an additional year of training specifically in forensic psychiatry at Yale University. And forensic psychiatry is a specialty that focuses on um, a number of different things. It's kind of a large umbrella. Care of individuals with mental illness and justice involvement, violence risk assessment, and also psychiatric evaluations for courts. Um, the topic of S-183, strengthening forensic mental health infrastructure in Vermont, is so important and timely. I'm so deeply grateful to your committee for taking this, to, for taking this on, uh, this work on this vital issue. 
Um, in my work with level one patients in Vermont, um, and I've been at the uh, Brattleboro retreat in various different roles uh, over the past several years, um, currently a senior medical director, prior as interim chief medical officer, um, but my colleagues and I have recognized a number of areas where we can improve our systems of care for people who experience <coughs> mental illness and have criminal justice involvement. Um, and I have a number of comments on the proposed bill. Um, I can also uh, outline a bit my uh, experience with the Connecticut Psychiatric Security Review Board, um, which is a model that I, I think is a useful one for us to look at. So my first comment is actually on the three-year proposed initial, initial commitment period. Um, and I have some concern about that um, for insanity equities. Um, I think that the need for inpatient psychiatric hospitalization or uh, community-based treatments should be informed by clinicians. That uh, it's highly individual what each uh, individual person, or in this case, insanity equity, would need clinically and a blanket period of commitment um, I, it's, would be both complicated and confuse the role of physicians in hospitals. Um, I, my concern, and this, this, this comes up from time to time, is when somebody has proved to an extent that they can be transitioned to the community, um, it essentially makes jailers of physicians and hospitals to hold them when they don't require the treatment, uh, the treatment context any longer. So it's practically and ethically very complicated to have someone particularly committed to a hospital inpatient context when they could be transitioned to the community particularly with, with support. Um, and that, that uh, brings, you yes. have to comment. That, yes. Completely <laughs> that, that position. Um, I understand that position. And that's quite frankly the, the law that we have now. Yet, we heard testimony this morning from the Defender General that a lot of people who go through a jury trial are found guilty yeah. um, because the jury doesn't want to see them out on the streets. And I suspect a lot of the reason that we might have 60 or 50 people sentence population with acute mental health issues is because this idea that the mental health system can't adequately protect the public. So you have, and I completely understand your position as, as a physician and, you know, this person is now, even though they may have committed a horrific crime, is now a mental health patient and is no longer a criminal. That's, you know, that's how our system works, that's how we've developed it, but in reality, we have this other problem right. going on. Yeah. So that, I just need to point I, that out. That, oh, that's I, the, I agree with you entirely, and I've uh, experienced that sort of gap, that if someone uh, <coughs> um, no longer needs treatment, we don't have a mechanism for uh, either monitoring their safety in the community or additional specialized supports for people who have demonstrated violence when they are symptomatic with mental illness. I agree with you entirely and I struggle with that. Um, actually, my next point was really how we struggle with that. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry, as conditions. I just, I, maybe I jumped ahead. Oh no, I agree with you and I think that's the crux of the problem. Um, and puts clinicians in a difficult position because when we're treating people in an inpatient context, and we say, okay, this person could progress to the community, uh, especially for people who have demonstrated uh, violence when they are symptomatic with mental illness. Um, I believe they do need uh, oversight in the community. I think that the um, Connecticut Psychiatric Security Review Board is a good model for that. It is um, an, independent, uh, um, an independent board um, that is neither mental health clinicians nor corrections. Um, and the 
position that we're left in now is sending people into the community with, without the clinical, specialized clinical support and without that kind of oversight. Um, so I think that the, the point where we need more resources is not, and more time is not necessarily the inpatient setting, though some people may uh, need to be in an inpatient setting for long periods of time. Um, that's in individually determined. Um, the PSRB structure, I think, is one that could be really inform us. And the Psychiatric Security Review Board in Connecticut, and only Connecticut and Oregon have that kind of structure, is a state agency to which the Connecticut Superior Court commits people who've been found not guilty by reason of insanity. And that's all insanity equities, um, uh, which are usually for uh, serious offenses, um, but not exclusively homicide. And they review the status of these individuals regularly while they reside in a hospital and in the community and oversee um, their movement in the community and increasing autonomy um, <coughs> as their treatment needs change and uh, and generally oversee release from the jurisdiction of the Psychiatric Security Review Board. Um, and that board is composed of a number of different people representing a number of different disciplines, uh, attorneys, representatives from probation and parole, victims advocates, uh, mental health profession professionals, there's a psychiatrist and a psychologist, and a um, member of the public. So I think that's a model that may that would help inform us um, and something that, that may be helpful for us to address where I, I think the, um, a lot of our difficulty is in um, people's oversight and access to robust treatment uh, in the community who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity. Do we have that model in, in our packet? Or can we we don't, but I just... Google it. Peggy can Google it. There's a whole okay. our mission, our board okay. members and staff. Okay. It's and our do reports, that. victim information training. Yep. Okay. I'll I'll do I'll um actually Peggy, maybe you could can turn you send on. me the link for it. It's it's the portal Connecticut .gov. Portal Connecticut. Well, I think you've just Google Connecticut Psychiatric Review Board. That okay. um, has a mission statement that might be helpful to start with. Okay. To protect the safety of Connecticut citizens by ordering treatment, confinement, or conditional release, a person is acquitted of a crime by reason of mental disease or de defect. <coughs> then as to what is the Psychiatric Review Board, I think that would probably at least get us there. Here. I don't know how to make that print. You can make it print. Yes. More power to you. I have a few other comments yeah, if please. I may. Yeah, I, I, um, I want to make sure that you've got the right resources right. Um, to research that. I, I wanted to comment, S-183 outlines that the court would assess an insanity equity's risk to public safety. And I wanted to make a note that forensic psychiatrists and psychologists have formal training in performing violence risk assessment, um, which is a process that involves clinical interview, review of records, and uh, use of standardized instruments. And I would recommend that a clinician's violence risk assessment uh, inform uh, the court's um, risk assessment of an individual, that that's a very um, helpful and comprehensive uh, process that forensic psychiatrists and psychologists undergo to look at violence risk. Um, I wanted to bring up another issue uh, that um, uh, has been discussed a bit this morning in the discussion of orders of non-hospitalization and that process. Um, and that's a mechanism for re-hospitalization 
uh, of individuals, particularly of individuals who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, these are individuals who have demonstrated, for the most part, have demonstrated that when they are symptomatic, with, uh, when they have symptomatic mental illness, that they become violent and aggressive towards others. So this is a very narrow and specific population. Um, and I think we need a mechanism for, to re-hospitalize this narrow population more quickly uh, than the order of non-hospitalization, which is a long process, allows for. Uh, and a mechanism for these individuals to have hospital evaluation and treatment uh, even when they don't reach threshold, current threshold for involuntary inpatient treatment. So this is a very narrow population who we know by definition has exhibited uh, violence and aggression when symptomatic. <coughs> um, and uh, in that vein, I wanted to make a comment that um, in my work with people who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity, which is both, both assessments and clinical work treating individuals who are insanity equities, I've um, worked with people who have had, uh, essentially are, uh, been found NGRI for a range of offenses, um, not just uh, homicide or attempted homicide, um, but arson, rape, attempted rape, and I think that um, defining the population for the purpose of this bill, bill more broadly um, would, be, would be logical given uh, um, that there are other serious offenses that I think would, uh, people would benefit from greater um, treatment resources and oversight. And my last point is on the um, forensic care work group. Um, which I think is really a wonderful idea, and I thank the committee for this. Um, what I would uh, recommend is to have resources allocated to assembling this work group so that we can have robust input from individuals who have expertise um, in other models that can inform us. Uh, and that, that would um, create, I think, a process um, and a uh, report that would be uh, really enormously helpful for us. You see it important for Vermont, to, uh, according to one of the documents we got from the Department of Mental Health, indicates Vermont is unusual and that it has no forensic facility. Do you think that's an endurance in your work? I do, I do. I think that specialized um, hospital environment for people who are broadly defined as forensic patients, so people who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity, people who have been found <coughs> not competent to stand trial specifically, um, and then often people who are in corrections but need a treatment environment that can only be found outside of corrections, uh, that having a forensic hospital um, or uh, forensic unit um, that's specialized in that treatment um, is unusual that we don't and would be a real benefit to Vermont if we did. Do you know traditionally other states if it's under the Department of Mental Health or the Department of Corrections? Um, I think it varies. It varies uh, I, <coughs> my, um, uh, I think that having that contextualized within mental health rather than corrections makes sense given that um, it's an area, uh, it, it's a treatment facility um, and we need to, especially when people have been found not guilty by reason of insanity, we're looking at um, ways to safely uh, treat individuals and um, support them both in the hospital and in the community which makes communities <coughs> safer. Senator White. Do you have any sense, and this might be an unfair question for you, but the number of people we're talking about, because when um, Senator Benning asked the commissioner how many people in our prison system needed mental health yes. care, it was about 50. And then when we were talking about um, how many people are um, 
a significant mental health yes. issue. Yeah. And then when we were talking about <coughs> earlier about the number of people who are being held, I think um, it, it was about five. I, I mean, what what no, what number are we talking about here yeah. that we need some kind of a unit for? So I can distinguish that that's a separate separate population of people who are in corrections right. and so symptomatic that they need intensive support. Right. I can't speak. I apologize, but I can't speak to the number of people who um, uh, uh, seek the insanity defense. Um, I. I know that in a given year there are approximately two to three hundred people who undergo competency to stand trial evaluations, though most of those people are in the community and those evaluations are done in the community. I can't speak to the precise numbers. Senator Benning had a question. Do you see a problem intermingling those who are PTs from those, uh, with those in need of mental health secure facilities? because of the way they've come in to be a threat to others or to themselves? Um, clinically, I haven't seen a specific, I haven't seen a robust issue or a problem with having um, a mixed population of insanity equities and um, people who are struggling with significant mental disorders um, and without criminal justice involvement. Um, clinically, people, people often need the same kind of treatment in the hospital. The difficulty comes when we work uh, diligently to support people in the community and transition them um, to have the kinds of spe specialized supports um, to do uh, risk assessment uh, to, and to look at what kinds of supports people would need in the community and put them in place. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank you. your testimony. Thanks. Thank you. At least a nice day to try. <coughs> Indeed. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Uh, Bolton, Middlebury. Yeah. Well, actually, it's Addison. Addison. <laughs> I should know where I live. Well, it's somewhere near Middlebury. Yes. <laughs> so, actually, my I've actually been to Addison. To Addison Town? Addison Town. Addison Town. Yes. I know Addison Town very yeah. well. Yeah. East. I think I was lost. Dead Creek. Yes, Claire Arrow is there. Yes, she does. Yes, 22. 22 goes through, I'm on 17, which goes down by the bridge. 22. Which they blew up in 2000. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so my name's Peg. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I graduated from UVM in 1994. I'm not going to do the whole thing, but I, my first job was on Brooks One at VSH. In 2005, I went back and did a forensic fellowship in Massachusetts, and since then, I have worked both in public mental health, which is what I've been doing until last May, and I do do these assessments that we've all been talking about, <coughs> competency and sanity assessments. <coughs> and I don't, I just want to say ditto to everything that Dr. Rabin said, I, I think that that's going to be, but I want to point out something to you that, that I think the committee has, has ferreted out. We have a gap in our system of care. We have our Department of Mental Health, which holds non-coercion as the highest good. That is a, that's a good thing. And um, we have this system that places in people who are NGRI or incompetence to stand trial squarely into our public system. Now, I, I was the doctor. I was working at Howard CSAC. Um, Washington County too. Um, so it is. So it is those folks and those resources which have been caring for the people who are found incompetent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity, and who are in the community, which is a lot of them, because we don't have a lot of resources, inpatient resources. I want to support that we will need facilities that are unhooked from treatment because there are people who continue to be dangerous even when they've maxed out their treatment, that may be a, that's a, maybe a forensic facility. We may not be able to get treatment funding for that. But I also want to point out, because my view is the community. I've been sitting in the community for a lot of years. And that's where I think we, we do not have a robust system that oversees those folks with these special needs. Some states 
folded into the public mental health. Some states, as we were hearing, maybe um, Valerio was saying there would be another, another stream or another way to oversee these folks. Um, I'm certainly in favor of uh, victim notification, but I recognize I can't do that be because of HIPAA. Maybe, maybe another um, agency or, or method would be um, there as well. So I think that the, this expertise, this looking at treating people in the community is, is a place that we really need to beef up. Others, we have done some things right maybe not meaning to, but we do not incarcerate or lock up people in the hospital when they're found, when they're um, not uh, incompetent to stand trial for a misdemeanor. We are not going to be <coughs> holding people too long, but we fall down in helping people in the community. Um, so I would, I would advocate us putting our hands on and thinking about how, how do we do that? How is that going to be, how do, we, how do we achieve that? those skills in the community to help because just taking one thing that Dr. Rabin said, when I would have a patient, for whatever reason, doing things in the community that were scary and dangerous, and we would put a revocation in, there's a delay and it didn't always work. We, let me just say, people with mental illness, the fear is that they're all dangerous, that is not true. But there are a subset of people who have been dangerous and have proven to be dangerous where we know that the standards, the best standards say a quick response to a higher level of care and then continue on their treatment. So there's a lot, I think, <coughs> fighting off a lot um, because we don't have anything. And I'll end by saying that's why I would really advocate for a good study. I know it sounds like it's the answer to everything and money is tight, but we really have an opportunity in our state to look at what we've done right, how, how we got there, <coughs> what we choose to do in our unique state and how we see things. I'm beginning to think we need to think a little differently on how we've traditionally went after, go after this problem. And listening to both of you, the first thing that I have as a reaction is we don't have enough of you. <coughs> and that is part and parcel of our problem. But we also have a very limited ability to raise money to go after this problem. Traditionally, I've seen people lodged in hospitals. I've seen people lodged in prisons. They're both in the same category of someone who is either a danger to themselves or others. It doesn't matter whether they've been convicted of a crime or not. They are in an acute new position, and we have them located in different areas where we don't have the ability to maintain people of your professional status to address what their needs are. Um, last night I got a call from a guy who has been Leave, he said 26 years as a nurse in a hospital and he quit because he could not believe how people were being treated in the hospital as well intentioned as they are and they do service a something of a need the bottom line is hospitals are not equipped to deal with this problem in the way we should be looking at it, in my humble opinion if we create a place for all patients who are in need, because they are a threat to themselves or a danger to others. And there's no problem intermingling those who are acquittees with those who have just come into the system through a mental health crisis. Um, it seems to me we might be able to concentrate the limited resources we have in order to have it properly staffed with people who know what they're doing, as opposed to the traditional way that we've been doing it, which is putting them in the nearest place we can find and hope that we can get enough money in each one of those places um, to address their problem. But I don't, I'm the chair of institutions. I'm a, the brick and mortar department and I'm trying to figure out with what little we have, how to get the right people in to do the right treatment at the right place. Um, so I, I thank you both for coming. I'm just batting around in my own head what the best way out of this is. <clears throat> Senator White. 
So just to follow up on that, in addition to the facility, we also need more robust um, community yes. for people who are on non-hospitalization orders. That's going to be the bulk. <coughs> yeah. That's going to be the bulk, and yeah. it, it's, a, it's an area of need. But I don't want to leave here like a Pollyanna. What? I don't want to be a Pollyanna here. You know, we, we all know we need more robust community. We just had a budget address yesterday that um, no new taxes, no new fees. You tell me how we're going to do that when we, when we have to make up, um, you know, and, and the budget also relies, I'm just <coughs> counting here, seven and a half million dollars that the legislature may not agree with. Three and a half cutting wood, eliminating Woodside. Maybe we'll agree, maybe we won't. Two million dollars on sports betting. Two million dollars on Keno, and you know how well that went last time I introduced Keno. <coughs> so, I mean, let's be realistic here in this environment. If, if we are, it is what it is, and we need to we need to have our resources spent more wisely. I think too, if we can. But Senator Benning's right. We don't have enough of you, mm -hmm. um, and if we. If <coughs> I say, I, I would suggest that when we have people that are incarcerated because we haven't figured out a better thing to do with them while they're awaiting a determination of whether they're guilty, not guilty, or not guilty by reason of insanity, we, we, we are doing a disservice to them and to the public if they could just as well be held if there was a uh, some supervision in the community or wherever else. Mm -hmm. That's that's how you spend money more wisely, in my opinion. You know, I I I raised the issue. It's not a mental health. It's an actual disability case, but one in Bennington that they should have known, would have known, was going to go wrong. But instead, we just let him turn 18 and age out of one system, and now he's waiting. You know, he's he's being held in in Rutland on the lack of bail after assaulting a family member. And how do you make sure that those community services are available for him, that the family will be comfortable in having him back and avoid jail? You know, it's not a mental health case, it's a disability case, but that's... You know. If I may just address yeah, one so. thing. I, because I, I, my first job was the state hospital, and we treated people on EE and treat when there was an observation, and I would advocate for observation again, that meant that the judge could send someone for so many days. Um, sometimes it's helpful. I get that we don't have the resources. And that's one funding stream. This is back in the day. Um, and I think that this being a brick and mortar person, I hear that. And we can mix those people to some extent. I mean, you're going to have some people say, well, there's problems, but we can. The problem is this funding issue. There are going to be those folks who are, are legally encumbered, um, who didn't have treatment needs. They say they're treated, but again, this is, I'm trying to unhook, you have some, some uh, public safety oversight, and that, I, personally, I think the doctor could use some help um, with that, getting some either, either hearings or a public review board. But they need, may need to stay longer than what is narrowly defined as acute treatment, or defined as acute treatment. So it it it's a it is a puzzle. It's a huge puzzle. Could be done in the same facility, though, couldn't it? It could, because different we had the different floors were certified right. and uncertified at the state hospital. <coughs> when you intermingle, on the other hand, those folks with those people who are simply violent <coughs> criminals. Would you both agree that's not the direction you want to move in? Not if they're not mentally ill. That becomes, I mean, that, so I, that's also a moving target. I mean, I would, I would defer to Dr. Radden too, but um, violent criminals, it, every person has a story. And some of them are going to be mentally ill and some aren't. And what we considered a mental illness for reasons of insanity in 1994 is different than it is today in 2020. So things change. 
Thank you both. Dr. <coughs> Doctors, thank you for coming today. I appreciate thank it. Thank uh, Emma, um, Herring, Herringen, I'm sorry I started coughing in the middle of your introduction. Emma represents the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. For the record, Emma Harrigan, Director of Policy Analysis and Development for the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Um, I think a lot of the points that I was bringing today have already been covered adequately by the State of Vermont, the Defender General, even the State's Attorney, and certainly Dr. Lovett and Dr. Bolton. Um, but I just want to reiterate that we definitely recognize um, why the bill was taken up this year. Um, there's definitely a need for more transparency and accountability when working with forensic mental health patients. Um, we do believe that models that Connecticut, um, Arizona, and Oregon have, these um, psychiatric services review boards, can infuse the right level of transparency and accountability into the system and also provide a place for um, for victims' rights, rights in the whole process and provide a structure to, to make sure that everyone's receiving the right level of service and that the public feels adequately protected. So um, to that degree, we definitely support the language <coughs> in the bill looking for a study of the forensic mental health system of care and looking at the Connecticut Psychiatric Services Review Board. We think that <coughs> a lot of good could come from that review and also reiterate what Dr. Robin said, that um, having the right level of, of resources allocated to the department so we can bring in an independent perspective would be really helpful. Where I really want to focus today is impacts. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about people waiting for mental health beds, um, community resources, and so I just wanted to provide a little more context to that. Currently in Vermont, we have about 10,300 patients waiting in emergency rooms each year for mental health services. Individuals? Visits. So I'm not sure how many are the same people coming over and over again, but yeah. <laughs> um, that would be a high percentage of Vermonters. It is. And it's growing each year. Um, we see changes about every year, two to five percent growth in the number of visits coming to emergency departments. What's really alarming is the amount of time they're waiting. So from 2015 to 2018, the amount of days that people are waiting in emergency rooms for mental health care has grown 87 percent. From 2010, it's grown 348 percent. So it's a it's a problem, <laughs> and I think. There are two. You say waited. You mean they're waiting in the hospital emergency mm -hmm. room? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are two primary bottlenecks in the system of care right now for inpatient care. The first is we just have more demand um, than we have supply. So we have 10,000 people waiting a year. About 5,000 get into inpatient beds, and we estimate 10 to 20 percent of those people waiting would have gotten into a bed if one were available and they just get better by virtue of waiting so long and they leave the hospital, potentially coming back later. So we have a very high demand. The other issue in the mental health system of care is that we don't have enough supply on the back end. So we have people waiting in hospital beds, not being able to access the next level of care. For example, if you have an elderly individual with, um, with psychosis, they no longer meet hospital level care, but there's no nursing home that's willing to take them or able to take them, that person waits. And so those weights really contribute to people waiting even longer to get into inpatient <coughs> And so for context, um, for each year that someone takes up a bed, that's 30 to 61 people each year that we can't serve who are waiting in emergency rooms. So we're very concerned about any kind of process that, um, how do I want to say this? Um, we want processes that optimize length of stay to what is clinically appropriate. So we want people in hospital beds for the right reason at the right time. And any time that we have policies or lacks of resources that create bottlenecks where people can't leave hospital beds, that's less people we can serve and more people that wait in emergency rooms. So just by that concept, any process that defines hospitalization that's not defined by treatment need is a concern for us. When somebody goes to emergency, are some of these 10,000 visits people that um, come in and 
treated and, and go home after, afterwards or go somewhere else afterwards? Or are they all end up staying in the emergency room until there's a bed in a psychiatric facility? So not all of them are ultimately going into an emergency room. I, I would love facility. to have more um, better so, understanding of the 10,000 visits and the waiting list and the waiting time that this creates in our hospitals. I mean, we all hear it from our hospitals, our local hospitals. Um, as a matter of fact, Bennington just started a, a program for adult, for young toddlers, mm -hmm. which replaces the going to the emergency room. And, um, it's called Puck, and I think it's a $125,000 grant from, I'm not sure, Department of Mental Health from One Care or one of those. One Care. One Care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it has uh, the promise of keeping those young kids out of the emergency room um, and uh, you know, hopefully it works but I'm wondering how many of those uh, do we need to seek some alternatives to like that for other populations I think we do so all of those people what I get really concerned about when we and this has nothing to do with this bill particularly but since you brought it up when we talk about people needing that are waiting in hospitals I get very concerned that we immediately jump to the conclusion that we need more level one psychiatric beds yeah. because all of those people don't need level one psychiatric no. beds. Those are acute beds that are not meant to be for a long term. What we need is a, a, a different level. We, mm -hmm. That's where, in my opinion, that's where we need beds, not more level one. So if so. I can address two points. Um, of the 10,100, 10,300 people we have waiting a year, we know there are about 5,000 to 6,000 who go into inpatient care. Um, meaning level one or some any, kind of any inpatient? Type of inpatient okay, care. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, level one is a very, very, very small subset. <coughs> yes. So that's, we know that. We also know um, from data from the Department of Mental Health and people who were held in the custody of the commissioner that there's a percentage of those individuals who the term would be called walking off papers, where um, the crisis abates, the person no longer needs to be held against their will in an emergency room or in another location, and they, they can leave the hospital or leave that setting. And that can be anywhere from 10 to 20% a year. And also we know from some initial studies by UVM and trying to figure out how many beds to build in central Vermont, there is also a significant percentage of people not in the custody of the state who leave because they wait, they wait long enough for inpatient care where the immediate crisis goes away mm -hmm. and they leave going somewhere mm -hmm. else, that other place we don't know. So there's definitely a need for those. There's definitely a need to make sure we have the right number of beds to capture people who truly need the care at that time, and also the right number of community resources to help people when they leave the emergency room or leave inpatient psychiatric care to make sure that they don't have a rehospitalization and they have a good outcome. Um, and then, because this has been a point of confusion in, in other committees, um, the beds that CVMC is constructing are not going to be all level one beds. So there is hopefully some capacity being built in the state within the next couple of years that will address the needs of more than just the most severely acute. Yeah, I just, well, mm -hmm. I always get very nervous when we talk about beds and immediately um, a great number of us mm -hmm. jump to the conclusion that that means level one beds, which, <coughs> okay. Um, I think most of my other points were covered by others. Um, I just want to reiterate that the need for psychiatric hospital care needs to be clinically determined and that we are required by both the ethics of our physicians and um, federal participation rules to treat people as patients first. So all <coughs> hospitals in Vermont, including the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, and the Broward Retreat are certified by the Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid and Medicaid and Medicare Services, which means they have to follow federal conditions of participation. Um, that also means that given the new structure of our Medicaid waiver in Vermont, and I believe Ina's probably going to cover this. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> yeah. um, forensic mental health states are no longer eligible for, for Medicaid match. When you and say no longer, do you mean today or next year? Or <laughs> we'll wait for the test. Yeah, <laughs> but that's a concern as well for, because every well, that, dollar... That, that's a concern that came up as we were discussing this bill is that um, <coughs> it changes the equation. Very much so. Um, <clears throat> so I think in that 
realm, we recognize that the flexibility we've had in the past to use Medicaid dollars to pay for forensic mental health is changing, and that there will be some need in the next couple of years to likely develop some sort of forensic mental health capacity, either inpatient beds or outpatient support services, and just being really uh, planful about how many of those resources we build, because every dollar we have to contribute towards that means it's a dollar less we can match against Medicaid to provide services for all Vermonters. So I think that's, and I'm, I'm sure you appreciate the equation, but that's, that's I think our concern is we recognize there's a need for more community supports to balance inpatient care and to assist in emergency departments, and we want to make sure that that resource is there. So making sure we have the right number of forensic resources is really important. Other questions for Emma? Emma, thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome. Yes, appreciate it. Um, <coughs> I don't think we have to. <laughs> thank you very much. It's great timing um, to have you following Emma with that. Um, but please feel free to introduce yourself and any other things you want to say besides the question that just, that just came at you. My name is Ina Backus. I am the Director of Healthcare Reform at the Community Services. It's nice to meet you all. I don't believe I've testified in your committee before. No. Thank so you for having have, me. Uh, <coughs> here. As I understand, you're interested in a, in a fairly narrow set of information, and what I've pre prepared for you today is, is narrowly focused on the background and parameters and just to be clear, it, you know, it, during our discussions, I think many of us have felt for a long time that Vermont needed a forensic unit <laughs> somewhere, either in the Department of Health, Mental Health, or Department of Corrections, or combined within the agency human services. And part of it, and we had testimony that um, I remember it was an appropriation during the year that uh, forensic <coughs> Medicaid may be going away, and if that happens, then you know maybe we should that would provide an impetus for us to do the right thing, providing a separate facility. Should I ask you a question? Yeah. When we talk about a forensic unit, what on earth do we mean? I mean, I, what do, do we I mean, mean? Yeah, do we mean people who have who, the 50 people that? Um, no. Do we mean the? the I mean people, people who have been found. It may be a very small group, but in my view, what we're talking about is people who have either been found not guilty by reason of insanity, not, um, not competent to stand trial. There's been a court determination that while their behavior may have been criminal, they're not guilty because of, of one of those two factors. And so what has been happening, in my opinion, is they've been taking acute care beds away from patients who are not forensic. And that's, and, it, and most states have forensic care. Now, there may be people who are currently incarcerated who have the need for that type of facility, and that I'm not getting into today. And that right. could also, you know, we heard when we were in Springfield about a certain small group of people who are incarcerated, who, who need significant mental health services. But for whatever reason, maybe it's what Matt described, the jury just wasn't going to let them off. And so they just found them to be guilty, even though they, they knew they were you know, mentally ill. And so the, that, that group may also, but that, that I don't want to get into today. I'm, I'm really right. talking about separating out that group. Right, I, I just want to, when we... That's what I'm looking at. That's what you mean by forensic. Well, that's the group that would no longer be covered by Medicaid, I believe. Yes, I can describe to you... So maybe we should let you do the testing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. I'm sorry about that. Okay. I'll provide some background about Medicaid, our Vermont Medicaid program, and how institutions for mental diseases have been funded uh, up to this point. Um, talk about what is required by our 1115 waiver as it was renewed in 2017, which is a phase down of the source of funds that we were using to cover institutions for mental diseases. And I'll talk to you also about the <coughs> waiver that we received in early December, uh, which provides for 
federal fiscal participation using federal matching funds as a part of our Medicaid program rather than the source of funding we were using to cover a, a subset of uh, institutions for mental disease for persons with serious mental illness and serious emotional disturbance. So I'll describe it, I'll talk about the limitations of that source of funding and the fiscal impact. Medicaid prohibits payment for institutions, uh, to institutions for mental disease for services provided to Medicaid covered <coughs> individuals 21 to 64. This is a, a part of the Medicaid program that's been in place since 1965. That is a standard of uh, federal Medicaid. An IMD is defined as a hospital, nursing facility, or um, other institution of more than 16 beds that is primar primarily engaged in providing diagnosis, treatment, or care of persons with mental diseases, which <coughs> includes substance use disorders. <coughs> Historically in Vermont, we've funded care at IMDs using a managed care organization investment. This was a stream of money that was made available by our first global commitment to health waiver, which the state received in 2005. It freed up money for the state to use Medicaid funds in ways that were otherwise not uh, allowed by the federal Medicaid program to try to reduce Medicaid expenditures for the whole. And one of the ways that Vermont used these funds was to uh, provide for treatment for individuals in institutions for <coughs> disease. Since 2017, these funds, which were previously uh, referred to as managed care organization investments, have now been uh, renamed as investments because Vermont is no longer a state-based managed care organization model. And these are still available through the term of our current demonstration waiver which was renewed again in 2017 and runs through 2021. The 2017 renewal of the waiver also required that Vermont submit a plan to phase down uh, these expenditures for the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital and other IMD expenditures that had been historically covered by this investment category. We were required to submit a plan by December of 2018, and we did so. The state was also required in the 2017 renewal to propose a lower amount of IMD expenditures for calendar year 2021. We have done this, but that is not yet approved by the federal government. We are still negotiating what that uh, phase down amount will be for 2021. And in 2017, the waiver renewal required that investment expenditures be completely phased down by 2025. For IMD? For IMD. Okay. Yes, for IMD. We're not taking all that yet. The proposed <coughs> phase down schedule is on the next slide to give you a, a sense of what the state proposed in 2018. <coughs> for 2021, our proposal remains 95% phase down. Again, that has not yet been approved. We're still negotiating that with CMS. During this time, CMS made available. Sorry, do you mean 5% phase now? In other words? Yes. OK. We would still be able to use 95%. Use 95%. Got it. Yes. During the uh, interim years between when our 1115 was renewed in 2017 and now, CMS has made uh, waiver opportunities available to states for covering, using Medicaid dollars, institutions for mental disease and, and treatment there. Vermont was awarded a waiver for, um, uh, we were awarded an amendment to our 1115 waiver. So it's still the whole same global commitment waiver package now with an, an additional amendment, December 5th, 5th, 2019. And that amendment enables federal fiscal participation, which is different than this investment funding. It's Medicaid agreeing it's going to pay for these services in Vermont via this waiver uh, for short-term stays at IMDs for diagnosis of serious mental illness and or serious emotional disturbance. How many IMDs do we have? 
we have um, the Vermont Psychiatric Hospital, the Lund Home, and the Brownsboro Retreat. Stays must be 60 days or fewer with a statewide <coughs> average length of stay across the facilities of 30 days All or three fewer. Facilities. Correct. <coughs> <coughs> this amendment, that's, that's one limitation of the amendment, the average length of stay. Another uh, amendment to this limitation, excuse me, to the amendment is the, the coverage for forensic patients. The waivers that CMS has made available for institutions for mental disease do not provide federal fiscal participation for, for, for forensic mental health patients. And CMS defines four categories of patients who receive forensic psychiatric care. Individuals who are awaiting psychiatric evaluation as part of trial. Individuals who have been found incompetent to stand trial. Individuals who have been found to be insane at the time of the crime, were tried and found not guilty by reason of insanity. And individuals who are pre-adjudication or have been convicted and are in DOC custody who develop the need for acute psychiatric care on either a voluntary or involuntary basis. Let me just stop you and ask, do you have statistics that give us some kind of an average region of <coughs> I, I do not, but the Department of Mental Health may have that information. What was the question I couldn't hear? Four criteria that are laid out, I mean, there's no page number on here, but... Um, <coughs> Page seven, it's very faint, I'm sorry. Page seven? Yes, it's oh, a very yes, it faint okay. printing. Well, page seven has four criteria, and I'm trying to figure out exactly how many people fit into this category and each one of those criteria on an average basis so we have something to look at for what the need is. Yeah, we'd have to go and look, I don't know that number on top of my head. <coughs> I may need that morning for our committee. Yeah. Thanks. Please. The, the amendment also doesn't provide fiscal participation for care for persons who are otherwise not Vermont Medicaid eligible. So that could be a variety of uh, circumstances where an individual is treated in a Vermont <coughs> institution but is not Medicaid eligible, including that individual being an out-of-state resident. And it also does not provide, as I said already, care for persons whose length of stay exceeds 60 days. Very importantly, all of these limitations are in place for the federal fiscal participation that's part of the Medicaid program. Vermont is still covering all of this activity using investment dollars, where our investment dollars are still available for us to cover these activities today. Yes. So the length of stay for those that, that exceed 60 days, is, does this, is this only for the highest acute patients that we're talking about here, the, um, the serious mental, I'm trying to figure out if, if uh, Medicaid isn't going to be able to cover anybody who is in a long-term mental health treatment, but they're not in that um, level one acute care. Is that what we're talking about here, is the acute? The distinction is not the level one or other care. The parameters are strictly around the person having a diagnosis of serious mental illness or serious emotional disturbance, and the person's stay being 60 days or fewer. If the stay is 60 days or longer, Vermont will continue to cover that using investment dollars for the near term. It's after 2025 that we aren't allowed to continue, or we may, we have, we may not be allowed to continue to. We've been asked to phase, do planning for phase now. We still have to negotiate the 1115 waiver, the next 1115 waiver, and everything <coughs> on the table for that negotiation. However, our current waiver document does say, State of Vermont, we need to plan for these funds not to be available starting in 2025. Just out of curiosity, I noticed the phase down goes 
75? It does. But what's the thinking there as opposed to, it seems as though Washington was thinking more like a phase down that would get you closer to zero. Is that not so? The, uh, the, <coughs> the phase down that was presented was uh, done so anticipating that Vermont should uh, seek to have as many of these funds available to it for as long as possible so that we could actively plan for and engage in the next phase of system design that would be able to work under a scenario <coughs> with fewer funds. I understand it, it's a gamble. It, it, that's correct. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense, meaning you would think that you would incrementally go down to zero, but this was proposed knowing that we need to protect <coughs> those resources that we have available today for as long as we possibly can. But I, I guess the question would be, is there a plan B if you get to 2025 and you've had 75% and now you're expected to go to zero, that's obviously much bigger and all the low-hanging fruit will have been Correct. collected. Um, so does that mean in 2026 there's a, there's a plan in, in the event that it actually does zero out? We, we, are, we have more work to do on to, in order to plan for readiness for this phase down. And that's something that the Agency of Human Services is engaged in, and particularly in partnership with the Department of Mental Health in that planning. And again, a part of that planning will inform our next 1115 waiver negotiation, which will be beginning um, very soon. <coughs> it's very interesting that CMS somehow, I guess, figures that mental illness isn't part of our health care. Right. I, I mean, because if some, if you had to be in the hospital for a cardiac um, incident, you could stay there for quite some time, and Medicaid would cover it. But, but um, we sorry. can just finish the Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, you're wrong with stuff. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, the, the next chart, which is on, um, or the next page, page nine, I'm sorry for the faint numbering, uh, is a chart that indicates the fiscal <coughs> impact of the receipt of this amendment. And in, I'll, I'll summarize by saying that the impact of the amendment is, <coughs> is uh, that now we have a total allowable amount meaning <coughs> Medicaid is participating in funding about $13.5 million worth of inpatient short-term stays at institutions for mental disease. That means that we still have a total amount that could become phased out. Uh, we need to still phase out, if you will, $29 million. Oh, 29 million. Correct. <laughs> Uh, we were previously in total funding 43 million of uh, IMD stays with investment dollars. We've been able to move 13 and a half million of that roughly, very roughly, into Medicaid program expenditures via this waiver amendment. And uh, the next slide is only for your interest. If you're interested in under this is of interest uh, for others in the building, certainly. Um, but we have an investment cap. And so this waiver also has an impact on the amount of space we have beneath that cap to make other investments. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is uh, hard to disseminate all this information, but uh, today has been extremely helpful in, in saying to all of you who wish to continue to testify in the bill, stay tuned, <laughs> because what you have in front of you for a bill is not going to be what you're going to be testifying about. So what I would prefer to do is work with, have the committee work with Katie and Eric redraft the bill and then get that out to everybody so that they can respond to what might actually hit the floor or a revised bill here. So if you'd like to testify further on this issue or follow it, please do. But if I could summarize where we're at right now, 
looks like we'd be looking at a study of whether Vermont should create a separate forensic unit. Uh, unit. We'd be looking at um, something similar to what Matt Valerio suggested. Uh, uh, we'd also be looking at something like what happened in uh, with Connecticut's system. And then also some form of victim notification may be based upon what we've what we've done in the juvenile system, so that it's not public notification, but rather a notification to the victim or victim's family. I noticed somewhere, I think it was Connecticut, they talked about the victim's immediate, who is the victim and the victim's immediate family. It's already defined in the Connecticut statute. So <coughs> those are some of the things I'd be looking at, and maybe an up to and not a. And be all, all criminal activity, not just murder. Okay, great.